So approximately 8 billion years ago, I made these videos talking about how strong Ichigo was throughout all of his different forms throughout the series of Bleach. And those were basically the first videos I put out on this channel, and it's been a couple of years, and my views on Bleach have changed a lot since the last time I made these videos. And I've reread the series numerous different times, you know, I've kind of grown as a person who debates the series. And so I thought it'd actually be really cool to kind of go back and redo these videos, talking about how strong Ichigo was throughout all of his forms, but kind of throw a little bit of a twist on it. See, what I'm going to be doing is I'm only going to be looking at Ichigo from each arc in a vacuum and then adding on the last arc every time. So it's almost like I'm doing the videos in a way that if you were to have watched this video when Bleach was coming out, this is how strong Ichigo would have been at the time. So not only is it serving as somewhat of a oh, this is how strong Ichigo's form is right here, but we can kind of go back and be like, ah, oh, now we have this interesting information that at this point in the series kind of bumps everything up. So we're going to be doing that in today's video, starting off with the substitute Shinigami arc, where really everything began for our boy Ichigo over here. And we're actually going to be stopping just shy of the training that Ichigo and Kisuke do right before the Soul Society arc, because I'm kind of going to be lumping that in with the Soul Society arc, since that's when he gets his Shikai. And he's so demonstrably stronger after doing that training that it's almost like a completely different form of Ichigo. So that's why I'm kind of separating the Kisuke training from the actual substitute Shinigami arc. We really just want to look at big buster sword Ichigo here. But before we begin, if you enjoy power scaling type content, that's basically all we do over here on the Bleach Hub channel. Make sure you leave a like on the video, you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of these videos. If you want bonus content, you can click that join button to become a channel member where you gain access to all past live streams that I've done and any debates that I have uploaded and will upload in the future because it is inevitable that I am going to put out these videos and people are going to run into the Discord have some weird mundane issue with the video, get smacked up, and then I'm gonna upload it for channel members for their entertainment. And if you wanna see those videos, click that join button. Now with all that being said, you guys should know the basic gist of how we do things on this channel. We're gonna go over Ichigo's strength, speed, his in-series power scaling, some abilities that he may have, and then maybe throw in some final closing thoughts, but that's pretty much just gonna be the video. It's a bit of an evolution from the first video that I did where we really just talked about his strength and some of the in-series power scaling. But with all that being said, let's just go ahead and dive right into this video, starting off with his in-series power scaling slash strength. Now, there's a lot of really interesting tidbits here when it comes to Ichigo's inverse scaling and a lot of the characters that he interacts with in this series. So I'm sure this actually will be a bit of a controversial video because already starting off, we have something that's actually kind of interesting and involves Rukia's own scaling and her own lore in the series. Because one of the first things that Ichigo does is he breaks free of one of Rukia's Kidos and she's like, you can't do that because it's going to shatter your soul and normal people can't even break free of these Kidos, but Ichigo does it anyway because his spiritual pressure is just that great. In fact, his spiritual pressure is so great that it actually blocks out her sensory abilities because apparently if you have more spiritual pressure than whoever you're around, you can actually just block out their sensory abilities, which is actually kind of crazy. Might be notable to talk about later when we get to Aizen, but there's kind of something interesting to note with a lot of this beginning stuff for Bleach. See, in this kind of beginning stuff, Rukia actually doesn't seem the most impressive because she and Fishbone D are kind of trading back and forth with one another. And I feel like there's this preconceived notion that people have because they know Rukia has a Shikai because the anime extrapolates a lot between her training with Kayan and shows that Kayan is the one that helped her unlock her Shikai. And so we're all sitting there with this meta knowledge, like why is she not busting out her Shikai and just kind of obliterating Fishbone D? The answer is quite simple. It's literally just that Ruki is not all that powerful early on in the series. I feel like it's really an obvious thing to kind of just point out that, yeah, we know Rukia is very talented. We know with meta knowledge of what's going to happen later on in the series that she is going to be a bit stronger later on down the line. But this is the very beginning of the series. Rukia is essentially treated as almost a random Shinigami that has a lot of talent. This is partly due to Byakuya's own interference because he doesn't want her to be a seated officer or anything like that. But she's not exactly a big deal yet in the series, and that's kind of the point of the Thousand Year Blood War. 
in the epilogue of Bleach, where we actually see Rukia taking down a Stern Ritter, becoming the captain of Squad 13. That's when she's kind of able to fully fulfill what she's trying to do. But you gotta understand that Rukia kind of got as far as she was because Kayan was personally giving her one-on-one -on -one training. And then that dude got obliterated. And while we don't see the after effects of how this really affected Rukia and her training, psychologically, that's gonna take a toll on somebody if the person that was mentoring you and was really keeping you going in the way that Kayan was doing that for Rukia because she didn't have a whole lot of confidence going in, that would really take a large toll on that person. All of this is really to say that, yeah, Rukia is not all that strong at the beginning of the series, and she's kind of just there to show you how strong the Hollows are and to make Ichigo look impressive. Because while Ichigo is able to break free of her Keto, and she seems to be kind of struggling fighting Fishbone D, because even when she goes downstairs, she's like, oh my goodness, this massive spiritual pressure, how did I not sense it before? Ichigo then comes in and just absolutely bends Fishbone D over backwards, absolutely destroying him by not only blitzing him, but then also just chopping off his body parts like it's absolutely nothing. And this is also when we have a bit of a contentious statement because Rukia says she's never seen a Zanpak toe as large as Ichigo's. And this confuses a lot of people because the size of a Zanpak toe is supposed to reflect the strength of the user. But there's a few problems that I kind of have with this statement. Not necessarily that it is the largest Zanpak toe that Rukia has seen, but Rukia herself should know that captains and lieutenants could have absolutely massive Zonpok toes if they chose to not keep them in their smaller forms, which is basically the exact same thing that Ishin says to Grand Fisher. And I find it weird that Rukia wouldn't be educated on this very basic piece of Soul Reaper lore. Then again, we do learn in Can't Fear Your Own World that the academic system for the Shinigami really isn't all that good. We learn that they kind of teach some outdated information about certain aspects of like the cosmology and whatnot. So maybe she was just getting bad information, but you would at least think, and this is kind of just in the theory zone here, you would at least think that she would question why Kayan and Jushiro, you know, her lieutenant and captain, are not carrying around these absolutely massive badongadonk swords. And then if she did ask, you would think they would explain it to her. So you would assume in like this scenario, she's not really talking about the captains or the lieutenants. Maybe some of the seated officers is fine because as we'll see throughout the arc, Ichigo is actually quite a formidable fighter. He probably would be a seated officer. This is also something that Kisuke will confirm after his training with Ichigo. When Ichigo regains his spiritual pressure, he says, okay, this guy probably would be seated officer at best. So I need to kind of treat him up a little bit so he actually doesn't just get obliterated by any lieutenants or captains. There's also the issue though that Rukia didn't even know someone like Renji got appointed to being a lieutenant. So she might not be the most in touch with the other seated officers. So this statement might be a little bit contentious. I'm only spending so much time on this because you will unironically hear people say, oh dang, Rukia said Ichigo has the biggest Zanpak toe she's ever seen. So therefore he must be able to beat Yamamoto which I feel like we've kind of just gone over and dissected this statement enough, so I think we're going to move on. But I do actually have to address it because there are very ridiculous statements like that going around. Ichigo's next fight really isn't all that notable. He fights Hexapodus in the park, and this is really just to build up some development for Ichigo. He really doesn't struggle with the Hollow. The Hollow doesn't have any notable abilities. It really just chases down this soul kid and Ichigo just kind of dissects it and easily beats it up. There's really nothing notable that happens in that fight. However, the next fight is actually a little interesting because this is the first fight that Ichigo really struggles with. And upon rereading this fight, I'm actually a little depressed that there wasn't more done with Acid Wire. Because for all intents and purposes, Acid Wire pretty much just beat the dog out of Ichigo the entire time. Ichigo is capable of blocking Acid Wire's bite. You know, by holding up his Zanpak toe, he's able to block him from doing any damage. And then he is able to cut his tail apart, but keep in mind that the whole point of Acid Wire's tail is that it has scales on it, so he uses it on guard to kind of bypass Ichigo's Zanpak toe, and Ichigo only cuts his tail apart when Acid Wire is off guard because he's focused on Orihime. And then Ichigo's not even the one that actually beats up Acid Wire, Acid Wire takes himself out because he doesn't want to cause any more problems for his little sister Orihime. So it's actually a bit of an interesting fight that yeah, Ichigo does kind of good in this fight, like he demonstrates his ability to block him off and cut apart his tail, sure, but Ichigo's really never in control of this fight. And this is actually kind of the interesting bit of the early portions of Bleach, 
is that the hollows at this point are still a bit threatening, they all have their own unique abilities, and this was just a really bad matchup for Ichigo, because without any outside distraction, Acid Wire probably would have killed Ichigo with him not being able to be cut with his scales and being able to just kind of like launch Ichigo outside and even knock him unconscious for a bit of the fight. Had Orihime not been there talking smack to her brother, the series might have ended after this fight, so that actually is something again notable to note. Little disappointed that they don't reuse Orihime's brother Sora, considering how impressive they make him look in this fight. Which again, might be something that Kubo wanted to do more with. I wouldn't be surprised if this is something that Kubo goes back to and fleshes out later on in the continuation of the Bleach manga that we're getting. Because go back and reread this fight, I encourage you to do that. They make Sora seem very impressive. Definitely more distinct than a lot of the other Hollows that Ichigo will fight that either have no personality or are kind of just these mindless husks. Although speaking of Hollows with the personality, the next person that he fights is Shrieker. Who again is also a pretty impressive holo because he gives Rukia the business and is pretty much just toying around with her for the entire fight. This is also the fight that people know as Chad's introduction, but this is also really good for Shrieker because Chad as a character at this point has done some quite impressive things. For instance, a steel beam fell onto Chad and Chad himself bled a little bit, but the steel beam bent. I don't know if you guys know how heavy and how dense these steel beams are, but they can get up to being about 2,000 pounds. So it's not like it's some rinky dinky piece of metal that's falling on him. It's more than likely a 2,000 pound steel beam, you know, solid steel falling on this dude and it gives way. Chad doesn't give way. It's not like his back broke or anything. The steel beam bent, all right? And this also might be consistent because apparently Chad also got into a car wreck him not being in a car, no, just a lot of cars ran into him and he was evidently perfectly fine and then carried the guy that was like in the motorcycle all the way to the hospital to make sure that he was okay. And then the most famous feat that Chad has is he uprooted a telephone pole, which not only can these things be in the ballpark of like 720 pounds, they're also firmly rooted into the ground and he just snaps it apart and swings it around like a club and smacks Shrieker. Now I say all of this and I gas up Chad because Shrieker actually takes no notable damage from anything that Chad does despite getting punched a couple of times by this insane beast of a man and getting swatted with a telephone pole, he's actually relatively fine. That is to say until Ichigo arrives because when Ichigo arrives he just blatantly dogs on Shrieker, quite literally tearing this dude apart. There's even a scene where Ichigo just blatantly takes this big explosion from all of these leech bombs and Shrieker's like, oh yeah, I'm pretty proud that I got this dude. And then literally the next instant, Ichigo just has his sword at his neck and he's like, all right, are we good? Are we done here? So it makes Ichigo look very impressive because Shrieker's very impressive just due to how durable he is. And that durability is impressive because of how insanely strong Chad is. However, it is after this that we actually probably get the hardest battle Ichigo has in the entirety of the arc. I know people are going to comment about Renji and Byakuya, but I mean, we'll talk about how he was kind of dismantling Renji in a bit, and then Byakuya, I don't really think that was a fight. That was kind of just Byakuya taking out the trash. But this is probably his most difficult one-on-one -on -one because he and his opponent literally wear each other down to the point of just absolute exhaustion. There's about two to three times in this fight where Ichigo nearly cuts Grand Fisher completely in half, and this is more of a showing for how durable and how much willpower Ichigo actually possesses. Because we learn that a Shinigami's life force is actually tied to their willpower. And this dude Ichigo gets a hand just shoved through his gut. People were impressed when Moro did that to Goku and Goku was still, you know, not dead. Well, Ichigo was doing that in arc 1. Not to also mention that Grand Fisher shoved like four fingers into Ichigo. Hey, which kind of sounds a little weird. Hey yo, pause. And then has also just been kind of ragdolling him for the entirety of the fight. And it's also rather impressive because again, it's a showing that shows how good Ichigo is in comparison to the other Shinigami in the Soul Society. Because we learn that this hollow Grand Fisher has been evading the Soul Society and the Shinigami for 50 years and has killed countless Shinigami. And it shows that Ichigo is kind of surpassing all of these different Shinigami over the years where they kind of succumbed to Grand Fisher's abilities, Ichigo kind of rose above that and managed to get a tie with Grand Fisher because at the end of the day, 
Grand Fisher was forced to retreat in his second body, and Ichigo was far too weak at the time to actually pursue him. Following this, we have the little squabble between Ichigo and Uryu. Not a whole lot is shown here. Kubo tries to kind of make them both seem relative to one another, but there's things like... Uryu fighting all day makes him bloody and broken, but Ichigo fighting all day, he's still raring to go, ready to fight Uryu. In fact, he even reacts to Uryu's arrows off guard. But there's little things here and there that they try to show that make them a little relative to one another. For instance, when the Menos Grande appears, Ichigo actually runs over to the Menos Grande, tries to chop its foot, and actually does draw a significant amount of blood. It's not like a small little scratch, he actually does do damage to it. And then Kubo has Uryu shoot an arrow at the Menos Grande, and you might have not noticed this, but if you look at the panel, it actually cracks the Menos Grande skin. And so, there's almost this perceived notion of Ichigo and Uryu aren't so much weaker than the Menos Grande that they can't kill it, it's just way too big. And with Ichigo not having a technique like Getsuga Tensho, or Uryu having one of his, you know, let steal arrows that he can let out to just blow up the area, they really don't have anything big enough to actually take the dude out. That is until Ichigo basically pulls out full counter by placing himself underneath the Menos Grande Seto, then allowing that external spiritual pressure to build up on him, causing his own internal spiritual pressure to well up, and then in one fail motion just release all of it in one strike. And while he doesn't kill the Menos Grande, he does wound it to the point that the Menos Grande doesn't think it's actually worth being in the world of the living anymore and it actually retreats. Now this is actually a very costly move for Ichigo to do because had Uryu not been there he would have died. His Zanpak toe begins to distort and his spiritual pressure is essentially going to blow up his body. And again this is a weird point where Kubo tries to push some relativity between Ichigo and Uryu because Uryu is then able to take in that external spiritual pressure and then fire it off from his bow to kind of just release all of this built-up spiritual pressure that is causing Ichigo to, well, basically explode. And I mean, he's literally having to take all of that in, tank it, not get blown up himself, and release it. So again, weird point of relativity between Uryu and Ichigo. I'm fine with them being relative. I guess Ichigo just has more stamina than Uryu. That's why Uryu is kind of like bleeding and whatnot. And Ichigo seemed absolutely fine after killing Hollows all day. Maybe that's what it is. It's just a stamina issue. The relativity bit does kind of make sense because both Uryu and Ichigo get absolutely bodied by Renji when he appears. I mean, Uryu just gets completely off screened. And I mean, well, we see the beat down that Ichigo gets and it's not very pretty. That is until Ichigo gets a random spike in spiritual pressure. And after he does that, he's actually able to completely overpower Renji and is blitzing him in the truest sense of the word. And when I say blitz, I mean Ichigo is disappearing from Renji's line of sight. Ichigo will be like across the street and then will appear in front of Renji randomly and then just launch him across the street with one of his sword swings. It is the truest sense of overpowering and blitzing somebody we've seen to this point so far. And had Byakuya not stepped in, Ichigo might have just murked Renji right then and there. Before that though, it is a little notable if you want to count this. I don't personally count it, but Ichigo does nick Renji on the chin. Although it is said by both Ichigo and Byakuya that Renji was off guard when this happened. And I mean, if a dude is off guard and the best you're able to do is give him a tiny scratch on the chin, I'm not really going to count that as a feat. But that's actually where a lot of the inverse power scaling ends. And there's actually some cross-verse feats we do need to go over. So we kind of talked about the things like Chad tanking the steel beam, which is about a ton. You know, being able to rip up a 720-pound telephone pole and swing it around like it's a club. But there's also some notable feats here and there, like Ichigo actually shattering the concrete underneath Renji. Which shattering concrete like that, really depending on how much concrete it was. But just for like general terms, I'm going to assume it's just a slab of concrete would take about 2,000 joules to break. Again, kind of rough estimates because we don't know exactly how much concrete is being shattered, and it's more being fractured than shattered completely. So it's a bit of a weird thing to try to calculate, but it puts them in that high-end street level to low-end wall level pretty comfortably since they can do these feats rather casually. 
and the fact that we have hollows like say fishbone d that are able to just break down ichigo's entire wall of his house or acid wire that damages part of orihime's house it's pretty comfortable to say that ichigo and a lot of the hollows are comfortably in that high street low wall level tier which is where you actually start getting the stronger characters like the menos grande in this arc who if we assume at the low end a hollow being a wall level character let's just say it's 15 kilojoules multiply that by 200 because a menos grande is said to be hundreds upon hundreds of hollows strong which at the bare minimum would be 200 you could actually get the characters cracking into 3000 kilojoules of force it could actually be potentially even higher because the menos grande itself just merely existing as hundreds upon hundreds of hollow strong when it uses the sero its spiritual pressure actually rises, which is noted by both Uryu and Rukia, so it could potentially be even higher than that. Again, this is a very low-end, very safe estimate for all of this. With meta knowledge, we could obviously get a lot of these characters much higher because, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't read Bleach, both Renji and Bianchia have something called a Gente Kaijo put on them that actually means they were at one-fifth of their power the entire time. But we'll mention that more in the next video as this video, again, I'm trying to keep it in as much of a vacuum as possible for just the arc and kind of just mentioning things outside of the arc when necessary or if I think I do need to address them. But then this is basically where this arc ends, Ichigo going to go train with Kisuke and he will become an absolute menace that invades the Soul Society. Now, aside from the AP stuff that we went over here, we also have a few speed scaling things to go over. Now, most obviously, Ichigo actually blitzes the speed of sound when he fights Shrieker, as Shrieker uses sound waves to detonate his leech bombs, and Ichigo actually blitzes over to Shrieker and punches him in the face, breaking his teeth, before the sound waves can actually detonate the leech bombs. Now, this actually isn't the most impressive thing in this arc, however, it kind of is if you're looking at the arc in a vacuum, because... Ichigo being to off guard deflect Uryu's arrow is actually really impressive because we know later on in the series they will call Quincy arrows light and that they are a light based construct so that's actually really impressive for early bleach speed scaling but they don't mention that in the first arc so again if you're looking at the arc in a vacuum best thing he has is moving faster than sound but if you're using some of your meta knowledge and looking at some of the other arcs and some of the other information you'll get later on in the series he actually has the ability to off guard react to light based attacks but then finally we have the fun stuff a bunch of just the weird abilities that ichigo just happens to have and probably the most obvious one is that he's able to see and interact with spirits even in his human body as when rukia comes into his room he actually kicks her over so it shows that he doesn't even need to be in his astral body to interact and see ghosts. It also means that Ichigo, when he's in his astral form, his Shinigami form, he is invisible to those people that do not have any astral awareness. Then he also has a weapon called the Zanpakuto. I feel really weird having to explain what a Zanpakuto is, but if you don't know, a Zanpakuto essentially attacks the soul of whoever you're fighting in an attempt to cleanse said soul. If you're a bad soul like a hollow, it cleanses the hollow bits off of your soul and either sends you to the soul society or sends you to hell. So you can also think of it as like soul BFR because you actually don't destroy that person's soul. You just completely remove the soul. You BFR it to a different dimension. If you don't know what BFR stands for, it stands for battlefield removal. And when we're having these versus debates, it's a win con where basically you seal somebody in a different dimension in a way that they actually won't be able to come back and fight you in a feasible amount of time so say character a locks character b in a box with one of his abilities and character b can't get out of the box since he can't get out of the box character a is actually won by removing him from the battle by locking him in that box basically in that analogy ichigo is doing that but the people's souls and i don't know if you guys know this but typically most beings most entities need their soul to function if they don't have a soul they kind of just become a husk and he can even use this ability in a non-combative way because you have the normal souls where ichigo can perform a console where he basically taps them with the end of his hilt and he just sends their soul to the soul society so theoretically he could be fighting somebody throw one of his soul pills in their mouth release their soul from their body which already would probably just mess them up completely, but then just tap the soul with the end of his sword, and then that dude's soul is just absolutely gone. 
Because yeah, speaking of, he also has the little soul pills on him at all times. Because if he needs to turn into a Shinigami, I mean, he's got to have those pills on him. But nobody ever said you can't use them on your opponent. They just never do that in Bleach because everybody's already a soul anyway. But if Ichigo needed to, he could definitely throw that into somebody's mouth, force their soul out of their body, and then just beat them that way. Ichigo also has a massive amount of spiritual pressure, which I kind of mentioned early on in the video that it actually allows him to drown out other people's spiritual senses because his own spiritual pressure is just that great. So it's almost like if you're not on Ichigo's level, your spiritual senses are going to be dampened. But then at the same time, if you happen to have latent spiritual abilities, because Ichigo has so much spiritual pressure, it might ignite your own latent dormant abilities as well as he did with Chad and Orihime. You know, just all the weird wacky stuff that you can do when you just have an absolute dump truck amount of spiritual pressure. Speaking of sensory abilities though, Ichigo's own sensory abilities are really good when he wants them to be because sometimes it seems like he's really struggling to sense things, and then other times he's sensing a soul inside of a soul as he did with the parakeet, which Ruki actually noted was very impressive to do, because it's already hard to sense somebody from across the city, but also sensing a small soul inside of another small soul is very, very difficult to do. So if Ichigo wants to, his spiritual sensory abilities are really good, If I guess if he's just driven enough to do so. Then finally, he has some... I don't want to say flight abilities, but he is able to stand on air. We see this in his battle against Acid Wire. When Acid Wire knocks him outside, he kind of just slides on the air. So if he's fighting somebody in his tier, which keep in mind, if he's in this like street to wall level tier, being able to fly or even pseudo fly is basically a broken ability because not a lot of characters actually have said ability and it kind of just gives you infinite range on them. And so he does have that. It is good for his tier as goofy as it is to say. Overall, after kind of doing this video for the first arc Ichigo, I know that him being street to wall level isn't the most fun and exciting thing in the world, but it's very interesting because you think about other street to wall level characters and you're like, huh, this guy would actually be really good in a lot of those battles because he's invisible, he can directly interact with their soul in a number of different ways, he can dampen their ability to even sense him if they have any sensory abilities, he can also pseudo fly around, and he's quite fast for his tier as well. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. If you disagreed with anything in the video, feel free to join the Discord link down in the description down below. But with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. You guys have yourselves a nice day. Peace. Late, guys.